Cram.com. Today we're going to talk about the first drug to be FDA approved for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. We're talking about terzepatide or Zepbound. Myself and MedCram have no financial connection to the makers of terzepatide. Hi again, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt, co-founder of MedCram.com, where we have multiple medical education videos, not just for providers who need continuing education credit, but also for patients and people who are interested in disease. We actually have a video on obstructive sleep apnea explained clearly. And today we're going to talk more about this topic. There is a new medication that's actually been FDA approved for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Join us at medcram.com. So to review, we're talking about obstructive sleep apnea. And that's a condition where basically at the back of your throat, your tongue, which is this structure right here, tends to be enlarged and the airway tends to be small and it tends to go back and actually obstruct that. So while you're trying to take a breath in, you're trying to have air sucked down into your airways, it can't because there's an obstruction there at the back of your throat. And when that happens, no air goes down, no oxygen goes down, your brain picks up the fact that your oxygen levels are low and it arouses you out of your sleep and causes you not to get good sleep, causes your heart rate to go up, your adrenaline to go up, and all sorts of cardiovascular complications complications can occur. Now, each of these events, whether it's an apnea, completely stop breathing, or a hypopnea where the flow reduces by 30%, this can occur over a 10-second period of time, and typically we see a 3 or 4% desaturation in oxygen saturation during the night. If we see this up to 4.9 times per hour, that is actually considered normal. So this is known as the apnea hypopnea index, how many times this happens per hour. Again, 0 to 4.9 is considered perfectly normal. However, if it's between 5 and 14.9 events per hour, that is considered mild. And if somebody has symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, that is a situation where we would like to treat it. If there are no symptoms, however, we generally don't treat that unless there's cardiovascular complications that the patient also has, like high blood pressure, history of stroke, etc. Certainly people with moderate or severe sleep apnea, so that means people with AHIs of 15 to 29.9 or greater than 30 events per hour, which would be severe, are the type of people that we really want to make sure that we're treating because this type of a condition, obstructive sleep apnea, is associated with a number of bad things cardiovascular events, neurovascular events, neurological, mood, etc. One of the major treatments for obstructive sleep apnea is actually something called a CPAP mask. This either fits over the nose and the mouth, or it fits just over the nose if you can keep the mouth closed, or it fits into the nose, again, if you can keep the mouth closed. The purpose of this is to put in this positive pressure ventilation, almost as if you're pumping up a flat tire, to get the tongue off of the back of the throat and to leave this open. By the way, there are other ways of doing this. You can do a lower jaw advancer, which we've talked about in our obstructive sleep apnea series. There's also various surgeries that we've also talked about that can do this. And while certainly people can have this and not be overweight, people who are overweight have an increased risk of having obstructive sleep apnea. And that's because particularly men, but also women, can store fat in their tongue and it causes their tongues to be even more enlarged. And so you can see that losing weight is the best way of getting rid of this fat here in the tongue. In fact, there's been studies that have shown that just a 10% loss in weight can reduce the AHI by up to 50%. So it would seem reasonable that a weight loss medication especially with all the weight loss medications that we now have on the market, might be beneficial in actually treating obstructive sleep apnea. A number of scientists went to work to see if this was the case. The medication was terzepatide. Terzepatide is a medication that is a GLP-1 and GIP agonist. And so how does that work? Well, first of all, it works as an injection by slowing down stomach emptying, making you feel more full. It increases the breakdown of fats called lipolysis. It also decreases appetite, decreases food intake, increases insulin secretion, decreases glucagon, and improves blood sugar control. 
some more mechanisms here. You can see that generally speaking, when you consume food, that increases the glucagon-like protein 1 and the gastrin inhibitory peptide. And that together will work on the brain to decrease appetite, decrease food intake, and increase weight loss. In the pancreas, it will increase insulin secretion, insulin synthesis, and increase beta cell proliferation and survival. And in fat tissue, it will increase the breakdown of fats and increase fatty acid synthesis. This paper, which was published on June 21st, 2024, was the result of actually two studies looking at terzepatide for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and obesity. Now, that's important to understand here because obesity, by definition, means that you have a BMI greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared. Let's talk about this Surmount OSA study. We'll put it in the description below. In Surmount OSA, they took a population of adults with moderate to severe OSA. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the AHI was 15 plus. Notice that again, the BMI was greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared. They divided these into two groups. They divided 234 into those that were intolerant of CPAP and had no intention of using CPAP and also 235 into a group that was interested in using CPAP. And then what they did was they did a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial where they took terzepatide and started out at 2.5 milligrams injectable weekly and every four weeks, so they did this weekly, but every four weeks, they increased the dose by 2.5 milligrams until they got to either a maximum dose of 10 or 15 milligrams, depending on what the subject could tolerate. And they did this for 52 weeks or a year versus placebo. So what happened? The primary endpoint was to see what happened to the actual AHI or the apnea hypopnea index. This is how we measure the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. They looked at it in both the terzepatide group and the placebo group in those that were intolerant of CPAP and would not use it, and also a terzepatide group and a placebo group in those that would use CPAP to see if there was any difference. Spoiler alert is it really didn't matter whether they used CPAP or whether they didn't use CPAP because the results were pretty much the same. And by the way, both arms of this trial were engaged in lifestyle and active weight loss. And maybe the reason why there was actually a reduction in the AHI in the placebo group, because both sides were actively involved with lifestyle modification. What they found was that there was a reduction in AHI of 25.3 events. That's actually pretty significant. Now, when you back that up against what happened in the placebo group, there was a reduction of 5.3 events. Overall, the difference was 20 events per hour, and that was statistically significant. It wasn't that the medicine was just preventing sleep apnea. It was doing it because it was reducing body weight, so approximately 18 to 20% reduction in body weight in these obese subjects. So these are people with a BMI of greater than 30. If there was a reduction of 20 events per hour, and we're looking at people here that are having at least 15 plus, you can see that eventually some of these people would actually have AHIs that were either less than 5 or less than 15 and not have any symptoms, which would essentially be cured. And in fact, 43% of the participants in this study number one were on the highest dose, so the 15 milligrams weekly injectable, actually had resolution of their obstructive sleep apnea with an HI of less than five events per hour or five to 14 events per hour with minimal symptoms. If we look at those that continued to use CPAP, we see about the same sort of events, actually a little bit more, 29.3 versus 5.5, which is a total difference of actually 23.8 events per hour, which is actually even more than we saw in those that were intolerant of CPAP. Again, about a 20% reduction in body weight. And in this case, instead of just 43% of the participants having complete disease resolution, we saw that 51.5% of participants on the highest dose, so the 15 milligrams weekly injectable, were able to get to disease resolution. Here's a more pictorial way of seeing it. You can see here, this is study number one. This is study number two. This is pictures here from the actual New England Journal of Medicine article. So we talked about efficacy. What about safety and side effects? So what were the most common adverse events? 
Prior to this surmount OSA study, there was actually some safety data that was used to get this drug to market for obesity, and we can review a lot of those. So the most common adverse events that we saw in this trial, if we looked at study number one, where the patients threw away their CPAP machine, and study number two, study number one here, and study number two here, we can see what the side effects were. So again, here's study number one, and study number one in terms of side effects for diarrhea, for nausea, for vomiting, and for constipation. Notice that study number one versus study number two here, here for nausea, here for vomiting, and here for constipation. Notice that the side effects in trial two was actually on average less, and it may be because these patients were on CPAP. So a lot of the issues associated with this drug means that there is slowing down of the motion of the GI tract and getting that food through, and that means that sometimes you can have bloating, you can have the inability to take a deep breath, and that can have issues with the compliance and the pressure in the airways that can affect the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. If we go back to those two studies that actually got this medication FDA approved for weight loss, that was Surmount 1 and Surmount 2, you can see that the most common are GI side effects, which is no surprise. Nausea, the most common, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain. These were mostly mild to moderate, but did lead to higher discontinuation rates compared to placebo. In those patients with diabetes, hypoglycemia is an issue. This is more pronounced, again, in patients with diabetes that was seen in Surmount 2, especially if on sulfonylureas or insulin. This was less common in non-diabetic patients. You could also see an increased heart rate, which was stable but notable, and it's a common effect with GLP-1 receptor agonists. What about other ones? Gallbladder issues like cholithiasis, cholecystitis, potential risk of pancreatitis, injection site reactions. Here's sort of a black box warning in terms of thyroid C cell tumors. So medullary thyroid carcinoma. This has been linked in animals, but not in humans as yet. And a rare side effect that can occur, possibly due to dehydration from GI side effects, would be acute kidney injury. But overall, the most common side effects are going to be the GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, some serious but rare risks like pancreatitis, gallbladder issues, and potential thyroid concerns. And for diabetes patients, higher risk of hypoglycemia. That's when the blood sugars go low, especially if there are other medications in the mix. People who have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, who absolutely cannot tolerate their CPAP mask and will not be able to wear a dental device because of whatever reason, let's say they're not having their own teeth which can't move the jaw or they're not able to have other interventions, this may actually be something that is worthwhile if their BMI is greater than 30. Now, why would this be a good idea? Look at this list here of all of the health conditions that are associated with obstructive sleep apnea, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, stroke, arrhythmias, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, depression, anxiety, cognitive deficits, neurocognitive problems, glaucoma, erectile dysfunction, asthma, cancer risks, although there is not definitive evidence of that, there is some things that are suggestive, and an overactive bladder. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients that have told me that the amount of times that they have to get out of bed to go to the bathroom has dramatically decreased after they started treating their sleep apnea. What about complications associated with obstructive sleep apnea? Increased arousal. So you're going to be sleepy the next day. You're not getting a lot of sleep. This hypoxemia is going to cause low blood levels during sleep, and it's going to cause cardiovascular problems. This hypercapnia, because you're not able to ventilate very well, can make you have a headache in the morning. Sleep fragmentation, as we talked about, impaired driving the next day, work performance decline, and then strains on your relationship, especially if you're snoring and your bed partner is not getting any sleep. So I hope this has been helpful. Again, first drug by the FDA to be approved for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. We've talked before about things like Provigil, Nuvigil, or Armodafinil, or Mordafinil. These are medications that are FDA approved in obstructive sleep apnea, but they do not treat the obstructive sleep apnea. They are stimulants that actually treat the hypersomnolence despite treating obstructive sleep apnea. So those type of medications are used 
most in patients who are compliant with their CPAP, treating their sleep apnea effectively, but still sleepy. This is not this type of medication that we're talking about here with terzepatide. This medication, terzepatide or Zepbound, is FDA approved to actually treat the sleep apnea itself. I'm not recommending this. I'm telling you what the risks and the benefits are. Whether or not somebody goes on this medication is going to be dependent on a lot of specifics. We're talking about people who have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. That means AHIs of greater than or equal to 15 and have BMIs equal to or greater than 30. If you found this helpful, subscribe, turn on notifications, give us a note, join us at medcram.com.